Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the October Conservative Women's Network. Thank you all for joining us today. I am Michelle Easton, president of the Claire Booth Luce Policy Institute, and I want to give a special thank you to our CWN co-host, Becky Norton Dunlop, the Heritage Foundation, our partner in these luncheons and talks since 1999. Now, you may have noticed that our usual invitations for CWN came not from Camille Hart, who's had the lead on running this program for years for us, but from Lauren Conrad, the uh, program director. Thanks to Laurel for step stepping in while Camille is resting a little after delivering twins a couple of weeks ago. And uh, she's uh, doing fine, and we anticipate her return uh, before long. Now it's my pleasure to introduce today's panel. As the United States Supreme Court convened its new term on Monday of this week, the first Monday in October, the Conservative Women's Network is so pleased to present three fine Washington legal minds to review key cases and issues coming up for the court. We've asked each panelist to speak for about 10 minutes, and then we'll have time for questions and discussion. First, we will hear from Naomi Rowe, an associate professor of law at George Mason University. Naomi teaches in constitutional law and legislation and statutory interpretation. She served in all three branches of the federal government. Before joining law school, she served as an associate counsel and special assistant to President George W. Bush. She also served as counsel to the U.S. Senate Committee on the Judiciary, where she was responsible for judicial nominations and constitutional law issues. In between government service, Naomi practiced in the London office of Clifford Chance, specializing in public international law and commercial arbitration. She clerked for Judge J. Harvey Wilkinson III on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Fourth Circuit and for Justice Clarence Thomas on the U.S. Supreme Court. She was also a visiting professor at the University of Minnesota Law School. She received a B.A. from Yale University, a J.D. from the University of Chicago Law School, and is a member of the Virginia State Bar and a qualified solicitor of England and Wales, and a frequent commentator in print and broadcast media. She also testified before the Senate Judiciary Committee on the nomination of Justice Sonia Sotomayor. Second, we'll hear from Carrie Severino, who has spoken at CWN before and is Chief Counsel and Policy Director of the Judicial Crisis Network, an organization dedicated to strengthening liberty and justice in America. In that capacity, she has testified before Congress and brief senators on judicial nominations, and she's been quoted extensively in the media, appeared regularly on television, uh, C-SPAN, CNN, Fox, ABCs This Week, and other shows. She's written and spoken on a wide range of judicial issues and regularly files briefs in high-profile Supreme Court cases. She was a fellow and a dean visiting scholar at Georgetown University Law Center and also was a clerk to U.S. Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas and to Judge David Sentel of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit. She's a graduate of Harvard Law School, Duke University, and earned a master's degree in linguistics, linguistics, from Michigan State University. And then third, we'll hear from the Heritage Foundation's own Elizabeth Slattery, a legal fellow in Attorney General Edwin Meese's Center for Legal and Judicial Studies, where her job includes managing the Mies Center's appellate advocacy programs, including moot court sessions to prepare litigators for oral argument in important cases pending before the Supreme Court. She researches a variety of issues, such as the rule of law, the First Amendment, civil rights and equal protection, and she studies and writes about cases before the Supreme Court, judicial nominations, and the proper role of the courts. And Elizabeth has done a lot of writing. Her analysis and commentary have appeared in the Washington Times, the Washington Examiner, National Review Online, the Daily Caller, US News, and the Daily Signal. She's a graduate of George Mason University School of Law and has a bachelor's degree in history from Xavier University. How extraordinarily accomplished these three women are. Please join me now in welcoming them in this order, Naomi, Carrie, and Elizabeth. Great. Well, thanks so much to the Conservative Women's Network and to Heritage Foundation for hosting this panel. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. 
So um, I'm going to talk for a few minutes, be a little bit backward looking at some of the cases from last term and uh, focus a bit on administrative law, which may not grab the fancy headlines, but before you all fall asleep, I just want to, I want to convey to you how important administrative law turns out to be. Um, you know, nearly all law now is administrative, and you're all in DC, so you probably have some sense of this, right? Agencies are pumping out regulations at a rate that far exceeds what Congress enacts by statute. Um, and what we have is a situation where Congress is frequently delegating lots of authority to agencies, and then agencies are essentially making the law on, without very many standards. And, um, and the courts have, in response to this, developed a framework in which they often defer to the agencies. So if a statute is silent or ambiguous under the Chevron doctrine, the court will defer to agency interpretations. So we have, um, you know, the administrative state has this, you know, maybe unholy combination of massive delegations of authority to agencies combined with courts that defer to what the agencies are doing. And the result of all of that is a massive expansion of the administrative state and about the ways in which the government can affect our lives. And so, so one of the interesting developments, I think, last term, and, and even in some of the terms before that, is that the conservative justices are, in their own way, um, starting to question, or not just starting, but are sort of writing about how they are questioning the foundations of the administrative state. And you can see this last term, there was a case about Amtrak, which involved the non-delegation doctrine. Um, now, some people say the non-delegation doctrine is dead. Um, I happen not to be one of those people. But, um, but the non-delegation doctrine is this idea that Congress can't give up lawmaking power to the agencies. And um, it turns out that the court doesn't really enforce this doctrine almost at all. They, they sort of accept even the most open-ended standards as being permissible. But we saw in the Amtrak case, there the majority, um, you know, without getting too much into the weeds, the majority there doesn't actually squarely address the delegation, the non-delegation doctrine, but both Justice Thomas and Justice Alito wrote separately to talk about how important the non-delegation doctrine was. And Justice Thomas was, um, in his very characteristic way, starting to rethink um, what the non-delegation doctrine could look like if courts were to actually enforce it more vigorously. And Justice Alito similarly talked about how important the non-delegation doctrine was to individual liberty, which I think is also very important. Because it's important to individual liberty in that if Congress is not making the important choices through the process that the Constitution sets out, you know, that's a problem because unaccountable, unelected bureaucrats are, are making that law. And so I think, you know, I, I would hardly predict that the court is going to revamp or you know, start vigorously enforcing the non-delegation doctrine. But I think it's important to see how the justices are thinking about that, um, precisely because the non-delegation doctrine, um, in many ways, goes to the heart of what it means to have a Republican representative form of government. Um, so another development in some of the cases last term also relates to, to Chevron deference, which is this idea that courts defer to agencies when they are interpreting ambiguous, um, ambiguous statutes. And you could see this, there, you see the suggestion of this in King versus Burwell. So I'm sure you've all heard about King versus Burwell, right? That's the Affordable Care Act case. Um, in which for the second time the Supreme Court rescued a part of, um, of Obamacare. And so I'm not going to talk about that, but I think there's an interesting suggestion in that case about how to, to interpret statutes. So there, um, if you recall, the court does a lot of interesting reasoning to determine that an exchange established by a state, which is what the Affordable Care Act says, um, you know, exchanges established by states get certain kinds of subsidies. The court says, well, that also includes exchanges established by the federal government. So um, you obviously have to do a fair amount of sleight of hand, I think, to reach that result. But, but for, you know, so like I said, I'm not going to get into that, but the, um, one of the interesting parts of the case is the court says the statute here is ambiguous, right? We're not sure if exchange, you know, run by a state really means that. But when it finds that the statute is ambiguous, it doesn't defer to the agency, which would normally be its course. When it says finds a statute is unclear, they defer to the agency. Instead, um, Chief Justice Roberts writes that, you know, whether these tax credits are available on a federal exchange 
is a question of deep economic and political significance that is central to the statutory scheme. And so there what you see is the Chief Justice is saying the law is ambiguous, but it's such an important question that the court has to decide, right? We're not deferring to the agency. This is a question for the courts. And who knows what this will amount to, but in a sense it is carving out a bit of deference, right? It's saying we're not deferring to the agency in this context. And um, Chief Justice Roberts has, in the course of his tenure, I think, been very effective about putting little kernels of principles into a case and then expanding upon them in later cases. So perhaps this is a kernel like that to sort of begin to erode Chevron deference. Perhaps it's not. You know, we'll only know in, in future cases. But Chief Justice Roberts has definitely been expressing a lot of concern about the lawfulness of the administrative state. And he did that in King versus Burwell to some extent. Um, also in City of Arlington, which was a case decided a couple terms ago, where there the question was, should the court defer to an agency's interpretation of its own jurisdiction? And um, Chief Justice Roberts argued that you shouldn't, right? If you think about that, right, why should an agency get to decide how much authority it has, right? I mean, that's sort of leaving, um, as my con law professor used to say, leaving the, you know, leaving the foxes to guard the hen house. And, um, and you can see this in other cases, too, by the Chief Justice. But there's a, there's a lot of skepticism here. And, and there, was a, there was another separate opinion last term by Justice Scalia in a case called Perez versus Mortgage Bankers. And there, there was another issue about deference. Um, should the court defer to an agency's interpretation of its own regulations? So another case in which the agency gets to make the law and then say what the law means. Um, and Justice Scalia, joined by Justice Thomas, expressed a lot of concern about that. And so I, I wanted to highlight this theme because you can see that the justices, the more conservative justices, are working through these concerns about an administrative state or a run amok. Um, and you don't want the agencies making and interpreting the law. And you don't necessarily want to defer to them in the assessment of their own jurisdiction or in the assessment of how far their own regulations can go. And so I, I would suggest that this is something to watch. Um, maybe it seems like it's a bit in the weeds, but how the administrative state functions, how it makes rules, how the courts assess them actually affect all kinds of things in society and across many different substantive areas. So I think that is, um, that is very interesting. Do I still have a few more minutes, or should um, I? Probably I move on, and then okay, yeah. we'll have some more time okay. later. Mm -hmm. I mean, yes. talk about Fisher later, but I'll let Carrie, you know, yeah. Um, so I'm going to talk about a few of the c cases coming up for next term. The first one I want to talk to actually is a good example of where you see a kernel developing, and that's a, a case called Friedrichs versus California Teachers Association. This is a public employee union case coming out of California. And generally, uh, the court, the Supreme Court has recognized that in cases uh, where someone's required to join a union, say you're to come, uh, working in a company that, that everyone is unionized and it's mandatory, um, you are at least not required to give them money for their political activities, because if they could force you to do to um, be paying for their political activities, that violates your First Amendment rights. Um, however, uh, in the context of public employees unions, there is a, a uh, case in from 1977 called Abood versus Department of Education that uh, was the first example saying that you could, however, even in a public job, be forced to join the union in the first place. You just had to not have the the, the quote political aspects of the of the your union dues uh, be charged. So you'd be charged for the general union dues, but not for their political lobbying. There was a significant dissent in that case uh, by Justice Powell that said, when you're in a when you're in a government job all of your dues are going for political things. Imagine, for example, in this case, in a, in a, a education context, things like how, how high the, the teacher's salaries are, um, how the tenure process works in particular. These are all very political issues. And they're issues that, that all the teachers are not necessarily going to have the same perspective on. And in fact, the, the, the plaintiffs in this case do not have the same perspective on. So the union is saying, you need to, you have to join this union, you have to pay us to be part of the union. Uh, because otherwise you'll get the benefit of having us negotiating your salary and, and uh, benefits, et cetera. Um, but what the plaintiffs are saying is, no, even those salary and benefits that you're negotiating, those are political questions. And in particular, some of the plaintiffs in this case have said, you know, we see cuts being made across the budgets, uh, the, the state's budget on all these other areas because of the, of the financial difficulties they're in. And politically, I actually think that those should be made to the 
teachers' salaries as well, or I don't think the tenure process works well, or maybe it doesn't even work well for them. Maybe it's favoring uh, some teachers over others in ways they think is detrimental to education. All of those are political perspectives that people are allowed to have, but that the union takes one clear side in. So uh, there, this uh, question of how to deal with public employees unions is one that's that ever since that 1977 case has been kind of festering because uh, it, it particularly came to a head in last uh, the, in the 2014 decisions of uh, Knox versus SEIU and Harris versus Quinn. These dealt with both uh, for, both of them dealt with the, this question in different ways. First, saying. Um, whether you need prior consent to use union fees for a political thing, whether they have to ask people if they're going to have a special uh, you, fees to be used in, in this case, and it was in a um, in a ballot initiative, I believe. And in that case, the, the court said we do have to give heightened scrutiny, First Amendment scrutiny in these cases, and they suggested that Abood was an anomaly, that it's 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 strange and, and stick in outside of our normal First Amendment jurisprudence to say that you even could be forced as a government employee to give money to this to this union, uh, which is making some political decisions. Um, and then second, it was it was a case of Harris versus Quinn that straight up asked the court to overrule Obood, um, but the court decided to take a narrow review, which in that case was to say that the, the employees that were challenging the case weren't actually public employees. They were in a sort of quasi-public employee role, and the court avoided the major question of should we overrule overrule Abood. But I think there's a lot of thought that this is something that's that's really um, going to be challenged at some point. So uh, this terms case, the, the California Teachers Association case, uh, also has two questions. The first one is, is again, straight up, let's overrule Abood. Let's, let's say that public employee unions actually are inherently political, so um, you can't be forced to join one and pay their dues. Um, but the second question has to do with how the opt-out system works, because the opt-out system in California says if you're a public employee, we're going to automatically just take your dues, including all of the political dues. There's some parts that everyone agrees are political. Um, and they say, we're going to take those unless you opt out. And you have to opt out every single year, even if you've been working there for 20 years and have opted, for opted out for 19, you got you got to write them a note. Otherwise, they're going to take those anyway. And so it's possible the court will just decide the case on that sort of narrower ground and say, at the very least, you have, you have to not take their political dues. After all, this is something that we've said the First Amendment protects people from not having to pay. Why should they be able to take it from you unless you object? They shouldn't really be able to take it in the first place unless you voluntarily give it to them. So that'll be an interesting thing to see whether the court decides to finally get its gumption up and go all the way and overrule Abood, or if they're going to um, just say you have to opt in. That still would have a significant effect, I think, on, on a lot of public employees unions, because you'd, you'd find out whether people really want to pay these dues or whether they've just been kind of defaulting into it uh, by the way the system had worked. A second major case is, is called Evanwell uh, versus Abbott, and this is a voting case. It has to do with how the voting districts are determined. And uh, it, it also goes back to a, you know, a, a decades-old case called Reynolds versus Sims. In that case, there was a problem where the districts, in a lot of cases, were even determined based on your county or, or had been drawn years ago. And the way the populations were shifting, they were shifting out of rural areas into cities. And so there was a problem where city districts were getting way more people than, than, than the rural areas. And so effectively, to win a district in the city, you, need, you had a lot more votes. Each vote counted for more in the rural areas because there weren't as many people. And in the 1964 case, in Reynolds versus Sims, they said they elaborated the one person, one vote principle, uh, which is coming out of the Equal Protection Clause saying if we're, we, everyone needs to, I have a, a quote here, they said, all who participate in an election have to have an equal vote, whatever their race, whatever their sex, whatever their occupation, whatever their income, and wherever their home may be in that geographical unit. So the question is simply, so they decided we have to divide it, decide these based on uh, to try to equalize population so we have one person, one vote. Uh, the question here now is, what population do you look at? Because now, actually, things have shifted in a different direction. If you if you equalize total population, in particular in, the, in this area in Texas, you find that the urban districts, while they may have the same total population, actually have a much smaller percentage of voters than the other ones because they have a higher number of, of immigrants, both legal and illegal, or, or ex-felons, or other people who are not able to vote. So the question is, if you want if, if we want to equalize population broadly, these are equal districts. But if you actually want one vote, one person, one vote it, to count the same across districts, you have to actually look at 
the voters. So there's a lot of different proposed ways to look at that. You could look at the voting age population. You could look at the number of citizens. You could look at the number of registered voters. Um, and so and there's a kind of a debate over which one of those is best. But, but certainly, any of those would be a better estimate to equalize the power of each individual vote as uh, than total population. Um, this, this has become a hot button issue in part because it, it will shift uh, if, if they look at the voting uh, population versus just the population in general, it probably will have the effect of shifting uh, more of these districts, the more, more voting weight back into the, ru the rural areas. Because right now, mm -hmm. your votes count for a lot more in the urban areas. So it's the exact reverse of the situation we saw in 1964. So uh, it'll be interesting to see how the court addresses that issue. Do they really mean it? I guess, when they said one person, one vote, or are they talking about something broader about population? And then just one final case to flag. Uh, well, actually, it's kind of a set of cases, and I'll flag one of them, is there's this uh, term has a very high number of death penalty cases. And that's interesting, particularly in light of the last case to be announced of last term, which was called Glossop versus Gross, in which um, the death penalty was upheld in, in the, the method of execution that was challenged in that case was upheld, but there was also a very firm dissent by Justices Ginsburg and Breyer who basically both said, you know what, as far as we're concerned, the death penalty should be gotten rid of entirely because it violates the Eighth Amendment. It violates cr uh, cruel and unusual punishment. Uh, and there's, of this case, this term, I think there are five Eighth Amendment cases that have already been chosen, uh, this term, death penalty cases. That's a huge number, and uh, it's interesting to, to well, I guess we'll have to see how it works out, whether this is representing the court's liberal wing that's going to be pushing, uh, in particularly Justice Kennedy, because he would be the swing vote on this issue, to finally just say the death penalty is unconstitutional, or, um, or how, how these cases are going to play out. I think the one that is actually most interesting, I like because it illustrates the fact that conservative as a political category is not really a good way to look at the judicial system. And that's uh, Hearst versus uh, Florida. This case has to do with how a jury, uh, how the ju right to a jury, the Sixth Amendment right, uh, plays into the uh, the death penalty process. So in this case, uh, there's a, there's a, a line of cases that actually Justices Scalia and Thomas have kind of been on the front end of doing, saying a, a jury has to be the one deciding any factors that are going to actually increase your sentence. We have a right to a trial by jury, but you can't have a jury deciding that you're guilty and then a judge deciding all these additional things which make you guilty of some, some you know, 20 years more than you otherwise might have been, or, or life in prison, or death, the death penalty. And so the, the Florida system, there are aggravating factors that are found by a jury, but it's not clear that they have been found, um, that the, the, the factors were found correctly by a jury, and not that it's something the judge decided, well, these aggravating factors applied, and that's what made this person uh, death eligible, in that case, that they were eligible for the death penalty. So I think that'll be interesting, because I predict that you will see a uh, what, what somebody's an unusual <laughs> ideological split on the court because you're going to see the conservative justices who are are not uh, voting this way because they're pro defendant or pro or pro um, prosecution, but really because they're pro constitution because the constitution has has a robust right to a jury trial. And then you'll also see the just generally anti death penalty wing of the court, uh, which is presumably also going to. Uh, feel that they want to they vote for this, too. So it, you'll, it, it'll be a, an interesting way to have the Constitution uh, hopefully bring both sides of the court together. Well, first, I just want to thank the Claire Booth Lewis Policy Institute for inviting me to speak today. I've been coming to these lunches for about eight years now uh, since I've been at Heritage, and it's uh, really a delight to be on this side of the podium. <laughs> and it's really an honor to be on a panel with, with Carrie and Naomi. They're just really inspirational women. So <clears throat> I'm going to talk about a few cases that the court hasn't agreed to hear yet, but that I think there's a pretty good chance that uh, they will add to the docket later this um, later in the term. So the first is the Little Sisters of the Poor and uh, a variety of other cases challenging the Obamacare contraception mandate. So these challenges um, involve the administration's requirement that most employers facilitate access to contraception as part of their employee health insurance programs. So the administration has offered uh, what it considers to be an accommodation to nonprofit groups that have a religious objection to paying for or providing potentially life-ending uh, drugs and devices through their health insurance plans. So the, how the process works is the employer sends a form to the government, which then allows the government to dictate to the insurer or third-party administrator what drugs and devices uh, must be provided to the employees at no cost. Some have called this a permission slip to sin. 
So the Little Sisters and others um, argue that this accommodation violates the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, or RIFRA, which prohibits the federal government from substantially burdening free exercise of religion uh, unless it can show that the burden is the least restrictive means of furthering a compelling state interest. If this all sounds familiar, it's because the Supreme Court decided a similar case a few terms ago. Uh, in its Hobby Lobby decision, the court held that certain for-profit employers, mainly closely held family-run businesses like Hobby Lobby, um, could not be forced to violate their religious uh, beliefs by paying for potentially life-ending drugs and devices, such as Ella and Plan B and other um, drugs like that. So the majority opinion pointed to the existence of this accommodation for nonprofit employers as proof that the government could advance its interest in providing women with free contraception while not trampling on the religious beliefs of employers. The court didn't say one way or another whether the accommodation was sufficient under RIFRA, though. So the Little Sisters and the many other challengers see this accommodation as simply another way for them to violate their faith. Some of the groups argue that signing the form still facilitates an immoral act uh, and that their faith won't allow such complicity. Others object to being forced to maintain a business relationship with insur insurance companies uh, that will provide these life-ending, potentially life-ending drugs and devices to their employees. So some people have uh, used the analogy that this is like a Jewish school being forced to provide pork during its lunch uh, to students, uh, even though a deli is paying for the pork, they're not paying for it, so their religious objections to the pork being present um, should be uh, taken care of. Or you might like to consider it Say you're getting married and you have an objection to having alcohol at your wedding, but your caterer is going to serve it anyway to your guests. You might want to fire the caterer, but you know, you're know you not paying for the alcohol. So under the uh, administration's theory of this accommodation, um, th that's sort of a similar analogy. It's worth mentioning that the alternatives available to the Little Sisters and the many other challenges are they could drop their health insurance entirely, which would probably be uh, not the best choice in terms of um, recruiting people to come work for them and their fees associated or fines associated with dropping your insurance altogether. Or they could uh, fail to comply with the accommodation and the mandate and simply play, pay um, a fine of $100 per employee per day. So, you know, really small amount, uh, according to the government. So uh, in the lower courts, the government has argued that these groups are simply mistaken about the, their role in the process. The administration says that it's federal law, not the employer's act of signing any form, uh, that leads to the provision of drugs and devices. Aside from the fact that the it's not the government's job to tell the Little Sisters and others what does or does not violate their faith, um, why would the government need to hound them to sign this form if it didn't need it other than to register their objection? So clearly there's something else going on here. I think the Supreme Court is pretty likely to take one or more of these cases uh, in the upcoming term. There are currently seven cert petitions pending. Um, and even the government has agreed, even though they, until recently, they had a 100% winning record at the appeals court level. But now the government has filed a brief last week saying, yes, Supreme Court, we want you to take one of these cases. So it's not all that common when you have both sides asking the Supreme Court to resolve, uh, to resolve the issue. Another thing to point out is that throughout the life cycle of the Little Sisters and other cases, the court has taken steps to, uh, to protect these religious groups from being forced to violate their faith while their cases are pending. So I think it's safe to say that the justices have been planning to resolve the issue. They have just been waiting for uh, the, the cases to percolate through the appellate courts. So I think this term is a, a safe bet that they'll be uh, resolving this issue. So the next set of cases I wanted to talk about uh, involves abortion regulations out of Mississippi and Texas. So there are two cert petitions pending before the Supreme Court dealing with these state laws uh, that require doctors who perform abortions to have admitting privileges at a local hospital. So this is a pretty common requirement uh, for medical professionals who perform outpa outpatient procedures. So in Texas, the case is Whole Women's Health versus Cole. And the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals upheld Texas's law, concluding that the purpose of the law was to increase the quality of care and protect women seeking abortions. The court upheld it even though some of the clinics uh, throughout the state would be put out of business and women in some parts of the state would have to travel up to 150 miles to get, uh, in order to get an abortion. So the Supreme Court, in a, in a case called Planned Parenthood versus Casey in 1992, uh, upheld an even stricter law that required women seeking abortions in 62 out of 70, I'm sorry, 62 out of 67 counties in Pennsylvania to travel at least 150 miles to the nearest abortion clinic. So um, this decision added to the framework that the court had created in Roe versus Wade, uh, 
and it determined that states can pass laws restricting abortion before um, an unborn baby is considered viable only if uh, the laws do not impose an undue burden on a woman's ability to obtain an abortion. So in the Casey case, and as, as well as uh, in this Texas case, the courts agreed that having to drive 150 miles um, is not considered an undue, uh, an undue burden, and requiring that the doctors uh, have admitting privileges at a local hospital likewise is not an undue burden. So uh, the Texas court basically found that Tex Texas was simply trying to regulate the medical profession and not seeking to you know, restrict women from, um, from accessing abortions. So it's interesting to note that in um, an unrelated case out of North Dakota dealing with a, a fetal heartbeat law earlier this summer, and a different appeals court suggested um, that the Supreme Court might want to revisit its undue burden standard, and it said that, you know, legislatures rather than judges are probably best to be making these sorts of determinations. So it's interesting that that's out there. So the, the second uh, admitting privileges case comes out of Mississippi, and this is Courier versus Jackson. And this was uh, before the same appeals court as the Texas case, a different panel of judges. And in that case, the court ruled against the state because it would shut down the only abortion clinic within the state. So women would need to travel out of state in order to get an abortion. So that law required all clinic doctors to have admitting privileges, and local hospitals had rejected the applications of two of the only clinic's doctors. Uh, there were three, uh, in part because those two doctors were from out of state. So the Fifth Circuit uh, relied on a 1938 Supreme Court decision called Gaines, which involved a state law school denying admission to African American applicants, but advising them that they could get a, a tuition stipend to go to a law school in another state. So in that case, the court found that states can't lean on their neighbors uh, to provide protection um, of its citizens' federal constitutional rights. So in this case, though, there was a dissenting judge um, in the, the Mississippi abortion case. There was a dissenting judge that said, you know, the decisions of private hospitals to reject these doctors' applications really has no bearing on the court's review of the state's duties under the Constitution. So I think um, in light of these two, two cases with very similar laws coming from the same appeals court, different panels, I think the justices uh, will definitely be taking a close look at this issue, uh, if not granting it. What a great review. Thank you so much, ladies. We have some, yes. <laughs> Thank you. We have time for some questions. I'm just curious, how many of you are either lawyers in the audience, law students, or in involved in the legal profession? Great, terrific. All right, we have some microphones. I'll call on you if you raise your hand, if you would give your name, your affiliation, and mention who you'd like to direct your question to. One in front here. Uh, no, here. Hi, <clears throat> I'm Penny Starr with CNS News. Um, when, you know, some of the huge decisions that have been made in the last term, which same-sex marriage uh, comes to mind, are there any way that these will be heard again in some other context in the future? Or is same-sex marriage the rule of the land, the law of the land from now on? Who wants to do that one? Or anyone who wants to. Naomi? Or uh, uh, Carrie? She looks eager. Well, I, I, I think in terms of the question in, in that case, that, 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 that particular question is going to come back. But there's certainly ways the case is going to uh, come back in ways, I think, chiefly in, in religious freedom context, actually. And the Little Sisters of the Poor will be an interesting one just because that is the, the the contraception mandate in that case was a, has been a big flashpoint for religious freedom issues. But if anything, the Obergefell decision is going to be even more so, um, as we've already seen. So I, I predict there's going to be a whole lot of more questioning on it, but it won't really be going to the question of you know, revisiting the holding of Obergefell. It'll be how how does that now this new constitutional right that that um, was discovered or or elaborated in, in that case? How does that impact? the rights that are in the, in the First Amendment, for example, of, of religious freedom. So try and make that balance. That's exactly what I was going to say. I, I doubt that the central question will be revisited. Um, I mean, you can imagine in some years if there was a change of personnel on the court, but um, it seems unlikely. Um, I think it'll be working out all of the ways in which the new right fits with more traditional constitutional rights. And even if it were if it were to come up again, it would again without those different personnel in the court, yeah. 
even if one were, were inclined to bring a, a challenge case, kind of like these other ones saying, please overrule this previous case, you wouldn't do that with this, when the same panel was still mm -hmm. sitting there, much like the, you know, people who, who would like to see Roe overruled. You would, it, would, it wouldn't have made sense to bring that case in 1973, whereas today you know, it, might, it might make more sense with a different panel. It might make even more sense. So, Can you talk about that? I was, that's what I was interested in. Roe overruled. Right to life. What's coming up? Oh, I think the, those, the, those Texas case, the Texas and Mississippi cases, I think, are the, are the key way in all of these. And, and, and actually, the Fisher case, which we didn't get a chance to talk about, but maybe, uh, maybe wants to go into, you see in the court, there's always, um, in, in, in this particular court, more even more so a tendency that you know we'll have one case that kind of undercuts something and another case that undercuts it more mm -hmm. and, and goes on or that they develop the doctrine sort of develops in different ways and eventually you may get to a point where you look back and say this doesn't this previous case now in light of where we are now doesn't make sense anymore or we've realized as we've been trying to apply it for years that it didn't make sense in the first place <laughs> um, or you just simply just get a different change in personnel and there are people who think uh, particularly with something like uh, the right to abortion found in Roe where there's a lot of question at the time even of, is this even a legitimate finding of a, of a right um, I think when if you get it uh, you could see that perhaps changing so these cases wouldn't wouldn't necessarily, however the court decides that it doesn't necessarily going to overturn it, I think you'd have to see a different personnel change again on the court to, yeah. if you want to see someone actually overturn Roe versus Wade. The, the current members of the court are, certainly wouldn't do so simply because Justice Kennedy, when he had, he's had many opportunities to do so and mm -hmm. has chosen not to. So, Naomi, did you want to talk about that case bit? I mean, I yeah. again, I agree with, with Carrie that um, I, there are not five votes on the current court to overrule Roe. So mm -hmm. there may not even be four. So yeah, that's, that's also true. Yeah, inter inter so, um, you know, just counting the heads. So I don't really think that, I think that's a, okay. it's not happening. Elizabeth? Yeah, the, the court hasn't taken um, an abortion case in, in a while. There was one a few years ago that they ended up dismissing, um, I think out of Oklahoma. It had to do with uh, the RU-487, the um, sort of like off-label uses of it. Um, but they, they haven't really shown an interest in taking anything um, directly addressing Roe v. Wade. Other questions? Yes, in the back, the gentleman. Well, first off, thank you for, for coming. This has been very informative, and I've enjoyed all of your comments. Did you give uh, your name? Christopher. I'm just an intern here at the Heritage. Just, not just. <laughs> <laughs> I was once just an intern at the Heritage Foundation. <laughs> she was an intern once. <laughs> Look at how high you um, <laughs> My questions, I, I think it's more for Naomi and her comments earlier. I just want to know, is there anyone who is in charge of keeping in check those agencies, those rulemaking agencies on the regulations they make? I feel like sometimes maybe they like to flex their muscles and um, exacerbate some of the, uh, some of the stuff they're to, to interpret. So if there isn't anyone who is supposed to keep them in check, who do you think it would be? Well, that's a good question. Um, you know, practically, I mean, you know, I think the Constitution requires the president to be kind of the chief administrator, right? He's the head of the executive branch. All these agencies are in the executive branch, and so they should be within the control of the president. And, and practically speaking, since at least President Reagan, presidents have been centralizing this authority in the White House. So there's the Office of Management and Budget, which overrules some of this. There's OIRA, right, which is a part of OMB that reviews regulations. And that has gone some distance to sort of making sure that regulations are rational, that they to some extent um, are weighing costs and benefits, right? So there is this, there are these offices in the White House, but there's all sorts of administrative action that doesn't go through that process necessarily. And so it, it's hard to say that there's just one, you know, ideally that overseer should be in the White House, right? Um, but, you know, we have these so-called independent agencies that are out there, um, how independent they actually are is a question, how independent they should be, you know, is another question. Um, but, but, you know, a lot of what happens in these agencies goes without any kind of centralized oversight. And there's also, I think, a, an increasing problem with informality in administration. So agencies are able to do a lot of, they're able to have a lot of effects without actually passing rules. You know, so they're not even using administrative procedures. They're using <laughs> threats or threats of litigation or coercion, or they're making, they're announcing policies and speeches rather than in regulations. So there's that problem also.
How about the notion that government is so big, the agencies just grow and grow and grow with more and more programs, many overlapping in different areas, that is totally out of control. And there's no way the Congress can monitor it. It's too big. Is that possible? <laughs> <laughs> Yes. <laughs> but, uh, uh, you know, I think it's, um, it's only possible because they're able to delegate to the agencies, right? Congress could never do all of what the administrative state does by statute, right? They just don't have the time or the resources. But that was one of the main restraints on keeping government small, is that Congress couldn't do all these things. But by passing off things to the agencies, the agencies have a lot of resources to kind of keep churning out regulations. And so... The expansion of the, the government is in large part due to the fact that the agencies are doing most of the work. Carrie or Elizabeth, comments on that? Um, reforms like the RAINS Act and possible mini RAINS Act uh, when agencies are up for reauthorization could sort of help with the, the hydra that is the administrative state. Mm -hmm. I'll point out that some of these other cases actually are thinking a little sister the poor in particular are part are also part of this uh, overgrowth of the original of the regulatory state passing regulations that um, I, I doubt would have been able they were able to get through in a democratic process if they were if it was something that was accountable and people were looking at and if they had to actually compromise when you once you gain control of an agency you can just kind of push things through without it ever have seeing the light of day this one has but I'm sure there's a lot of other types of things that wouldn't have flown in in a uh, it, from, through Congress, even just aside from not having time, wouldn't actually have had the political will to pass uh, the regulations. But the agencies are shielded from that. It's really hard to pass a statute. Yeah, so yeah. And, and, and maybe that's that. maybe that's well, a feature, not a bug. A, that's right. Exactly. It's very much a feature. Mm -hmm. Right. This lady. Hi, my name is Frida Hugley. I'm just a visitor. I mean, this is for Carrie. Why are they counting illegals in voting? Well, what they're counting is population. And since uh, I believe the census doesn't ask whether you are here, whether you're a citizen, whether you're not a citizen, let alone whether you're here legally or illegally, I think they feel like they wouldn't be any good to ask if you're here legally or illegally because you'd either just refuse to answer or lie. But um, but uh, they don't they don't actually ask the question. So one concern people have raised is said, well, it'd be too hard to use numbers that more accurately get at the popul the voting population um, because we just don't know because the census doesn't doesn't ask these questions. I, you know, my response would be, the census could ask. I mean, we could try to have a more narrow definition, but I think I think actually part of it is 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 really people who if the voting um, apportionment process, and there's another case that addresses this uh, coming up this term as well, is really just uh, plagued. It's almost a sort of how to lie with statistics game in many ways on, from, on both sides. Everyone's trying to figure out how to draw districts in ways that are as that, that follow the rules as much as possible while helping their side as much as possible. So if you're looking for ways to help the uh, boost the number of, of, of districts that are in urban areas because that helps your party, and, and it helps to count total population, that's what you're going to do. And so I think this is part of the reason you see the lineups um, politically on these on these cases. You're going to see a big political fight on, on them uh, the way it is. But I, I agree, it does seem a little strange to be counting um, people who, who don't actually have a right to vote. And it certainly, do, it, but it certainly doesn't make sense if you're counting, if you're trying to make one person one vote equal across uh, across things. Some people have claimed, you know, this it makes sense because they're representing really the area, not the not just the voters, because they are representing also, you know, children under the age of 18 or, the, you know, things like all, all sorts of people. And, you know, you go way back in history, they were representing the women who didn't have the right to vote uh, back when men were voting. But I think it's it's significant that this is all, we're all looking at this kind of post, now, now in a world where all adults have the right to vote. Um, and so in, if the Equal Protection Clause, if we're going to st stick with the idea that it requires a one person, one vote, then we're, then we're talking about the voters are what's being represented here, and we need to make sure um, that, that their votes are equalized. And they, they may take into account the other people in their lives, like, like children or something, that, are, that don't have the right to vote yet. But, um, but the representation should make their votes equal. I think that this will be an interesting case also from, an, from the, what the originalists will have to say mm -hmm. about this because historically, right, I mean, the voters, as Carrie said, were a very narrow group of people, right, white men, right, white, white men. male property owners, mm -hmm. right? So the idea of the census when you, you know, read, like, the founders, it's quite obvious they contemplated 
the whole population, right, which included many non-voters, right, women. Although only, un un unfortunately, only three-fifths of certain populations. And only three, I mean, right. So the so they're, it's they're a challenge because the Constitution actually is, is stuff we're not really comfortable with on this level right. in many cases, right. too. It's like, oh, so, that was So awkward. this this question of who represents we as voters is, yeah. it's a really interesting one. And I don't yeah. know that the lines will necessarily be very, the yeah. traditional right-left. I think there could be some interesting things that come out of this case. Yeah. And what we're interpreting is not really the Constitution itself so much as this previous. I mean, when you're talking about the one person, one vote language, that's not in the Constitution. No, it's, right. it's, it's just that's, that's them getting something out of the Equal Protection Clause, right. which makes sense, but then how to apply it is, you know, mm -hmm. not always yeah. obvious. Any other questions? Beck? Yes. Mike? Uh, yes. I, uh, Becky Norton Dunlop with the Heritage Foundation. I am curious uh, to hear from each of you who are the jurists, other than those on the Supreme Court, that you think conservatives should be uh, paying close attention to their opinions and um, watching them in the next couple of years? Elizabeth, you want to go first? Are you saying for potential Supreme Court shortlist? <laughs> I think that's what she means. <laughs> um, well, one of, my, one of my favorites to read is Janice Rogers Brown from the D.C. Circuit. Um, her opinions are always very thorough and take things back to, uh, to the original roots. Um, so I, I really think she's one of my favorites, uh, most enjoyable to read. I'm a fan of uh, Diane Sykes in the Seventh Circuit. She's very good. A Judge Pryor in the Eleventh is also good. He'd probably be on my short list. Mm -hmm. Well, I have to say Judge Wilkinson, right? Because I go for it. <laughs> of course. <laughs> what about Judge Santel? <laughs> oh, well, he, he's he's excellent. I guess it, it depends. It depends on whether you're talking short list. Yes. Given that he's already taken senior status, I'm yes, not sure he's he's I'm he's on a teasing. short list. I'm just but um, but he's he's right 90 percent of the time at least. <laughs> um, I excellent. enjoy Brett Kavanaugh's decisions a lot on the D.C. Circuit. He's um, he's also very thoughtful and I think doing a lot of serious work in rethinking some of these issues about the administrative state. So very smart, good jurist. There was a discussion in the last debate about uh, the selection of recent Supreme Court justices and how there was a tendency to go with people who had shorter records because it was easier to push them through than people that had longer, uh, very clear records. Any comments on that before we wrap up here? This is one that's getting a lot of play in the in the debates already because the next president is likely to have maybe three appointments to the Supreme Court. We have a lot of judges who are getting towards retirement age, and uh, they, you could have someone who either either from the opposite party replacing Ginsburg or Scalia, or you know someone's going to replace Justice Kennedy, and no matter who that's replaced with, it's going to be a huge shift in the court because really his swing vote has dominated where the court goes. Um, I think. A lot of people, particularly after these two Obamacare decisions by Chief Justice Roberts, and frankly, there's a series of other decisions that um, I, I not can't really buy into that he's done in ways that he doesn't seem to have been willing to step up and make a make a call on on a case, and rather instead found ways that I didn't think were quite legitimate to avoid serious constitutional questions. I think he's someone that people have seen as an example of maybe even though he did have he did have a record, including a, very, a short period on the court. On, a, on the DC Circuit, um, that maybe we didn't know clearly enough what his how his, what his judicial philosophy really was going into the court, and so I think I think it's it just is a reminder of how important having experience and in particular judicial experience is going forward uh, to try to pick a judge that isn't going to um, just so you know what the real philosophy is and aren't, aren't surprised. And some people suggest that um, Roberts as Chief Justice versus Roberts as just uh, an associate justice, which he was originally nominated for one of those seats, um, he he may be more restrained as chief justice, and he's more concerned with the uh, the court as an institution and and promoting that. And you know, we've seen how that's worked out. I, I would also say that I think this issue is uniquely important for Republican candidates because if your view is that you want to nominate. 
um, judges and justices who follow the law, which is hard to do. Um, you really need to have a record. If your judicial philosophy is like the current president's, I want jurists who rule from the heart, you can get a sense of a person's policy perspectives and what outcomes they prefer, and you're usually right. But you know, following the law is hard, right? Following the law when you don't necessarily agree with the outcome, following the Constitution, following the statute. Um, and it takes a certain mindset. And so if that's what Republican candidates want, then they really have to know that they're getting someone who will do that. Because I think it's hard. Um, at least it's hard for some people. Maybe not for our former boss. But um, but it's, it's a harder question. I mean, even take like the, the, the one person, one vote case we were talking about. If, it's an, if you say, oh, do I want the Republicans to win and the Democrats to win in this case? It's an easy question. You know which one is going to probably shift the votes in the right direction. But if you say, I really want to make sure I am figuring out what the Constitution requires here, it's, it's a lot harder. You have right. to go back and say, what is the original meaning here? What is the original meaning I mean, of the 14th Amendment? And the Amendment? little I've looked at it, like I have it? no sense, like without doing a lot more work, mm -hmm. you know, what the right answer in that case would be, you know? And yeah. I think that that's true for, so I think, you know, I think it's actually particularly important for conservatives to, to have someone with a record. Excellent point, thank you. Thank you so much, ladies. Uh, what a great presentation. We want to give you some gifts, but please let's thank them first. Ladies from the Claire Booth Loose oh. Policy Institute, we have for you our limited edition oh. coffee mug with a very true saying from Claire Booth Loose. Here, I'll let you read it. Okay. Ah, no good deed goes unpunished. Right. <laughs> yes. And a wonderful little tote bag. Yeah, we have one of these you. for each of you. Thank you very much. And uh, on behalf of the Heritage Foundation, we're going to give you one of our prize publications, the Heritage Guide to the Constitution. Uh, I'm, my suspicion is that each of you have one of these on your shelf already. We are definitely in favor of regifting. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It's a real nice fabric you get presents. Yeah. I like it. Thank you. You probably not one of the two prizes. The, the beauty of co-sponsorship, right? Know, right? It was really a terrific discussion. Thank you so much for coming out at lunch. And I think Heritage is providing us with a wonderful lunch outside. Yes, and since there's no such thing as a free lunch, let's give these ladies another final round of applause. <laughs>